Let me pray and then we'll start. Uh, Dear Father in heaven, we pray very simply that through your word and by your spirit, you would speak to us now. Father, please help us. Please help me. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. Uh, I uh, want to begin by making an assumption. I I realize that's not always a wise thing to do. I think I'm on safe ground here. My assumption is this. We all need reassurance. We all need uh, reassurance. The, The truth is, before I'm a shepherd, I'm a sheep. And it's the nature of sheep to need reassurance. Uh, Before I'm a pastor or or a pastor's wife, uh, before I'm an elder or a woman's worker, before I'm a church member or or even a national director, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. And it is the nature of disciples to need encouragement. We all need reassurance. But there are other reasons too. Uh, As a family of churches, we are committed to working together together to reach our nation for Christ. That is a glorious task, but sometimes the size of the task is overwhelming, is it not? Our culture is increasingly secular. Most people are largely ignorant of the Christian faith. Basic Christian beliefs seem old-fashioned at best or dangerously intolerant at worst. Statistics suggest that less than 3% of the population are born-again believers. That the simple reality is that you and I, we are surrounded by people who are without Christ and without hope in our world. Uh, And what is more, despite our best efforts, we are seeing relatively few people becoming Christians. Uh, Our own research suggests that few churches are experiencing more than 1% growth per year by way of conversions. Now, brothers and sisters, there are many, many encouraging things happening across our family of churches. We'll hear about some of them over the conference. We should give thanks to God for these. But the reality is we are barely scratching the surface. It's not surprising then that the the latest edition of the prayer guide, Operation World, I don't know whether you use it, it talks about what it calls the widespread loss of confidence amongst evangelical Christians in the UK, a a cynicism about the church's future. I wonder if you know people who are wrestling with those things. Uh, In his uh, book, Knowing Our Times, which was given away at the conference last year, Uh, John Stevens writes this. As I travel the country, I find that many faithful churches and gospel ministers are discouraged. They preach Christ boldly and make every effort to reach their community, often with limited resources. However, they see little apparent fruit from their efforts, or at least much less than they long and pray for. They compare themselves with past periods of evangelical history and wonder what they're doing wrong. They assume that others elsewhere are seeing more dramatic success with the result that they either feel inadequate or are constantly searching for the silver bullet that will transform their ministry. In most cases, they are simply experiencing what is normal for gospel ministry in Britain at this moment of history. Uh, Brothers and sisters, I wonder uh, if you can relate to that. Uh, I wonder if that is your experience. We all need reassurance. Now given this, I am thrilled that we're looking at the book of Acts in our conference sermons uh, this year. Uh, Acts is perfect for us. Uh, Just turn, if you shut your Bibles, turn back to Acts chapter 1. Have a look at verse 1. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. 
Uh, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. Uh, Luke deliberately ties his gospel and the book of Acts together. Uh, if the gospel of Luke is about what Jesus began to do and to teach, then the book of Acts is about what the risen Lord Jesus continues to do and teach through his people in the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, think of Acts as volume one, uh, uh, sorry, Luke as volume one, and Acts as volume two in the continuing story of Jesus Christ. Now I take it therefore that the, the purpose of both volumes is the same. Well, what did Luke say it was? Luke wanted Theophilus to know the certainty of the things he had been taught. Most likely, Theophilus was a believer. But Theophilus, like us, needed reassurance. Reassurance that the gospel was really true. Reassurance that the Lord Jesus really was still at work. Reassurance that his plans would still be accomplished. Brothers and sisters, I take it, you and I, we, we are no different to Theophilus. We all need reassurance. And Acts chapter 1 is very good news for us. Uh, Acts begins where uh, Luke left off with the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Look at verse 3. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Luke reminds us that the resurrection proves that Jesus is the Messiah, God's special anointed king, the king of his kingdom. In a few days' time, Jesus will be taken up to heaven to sit at his Father's right hand and reign as Lord of all. One day, this same Jesus, he will return in power and glory. In the meantime, the apostles have work to do. But before they can start that work, Jesus tells them to wait. Look at verse 4. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, don't you find that striking? Before they do anything, they must wait. The point is they can't do the work that Jesus calls them to do without the gift of the Holy Spirit. They need the Holy Spirit. But why? Well, Jesus explains in verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of of the earth. This is Luke's account of the Great Commission. This is the mission of the church. This is what the risen Lord Jesus calls you and I to do as we wait for his return. He wants us to proclaim the good news of the kingdom to the very ends of the earth. Now think about that for a moment. On the face of it, does that not seem like an impossible task. He wants us to proclaim the good news of the kingdom to the ends of the earth. Let's look at verse 8 again. I want you to notice something. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This is a promise. This is a promise of the risen Lord Jesus. And therefore, you and I can be absolutely sure that this will happen. 
The, the, the lesson is the mission of the risen Lord Jesus, it will be accomplished. The, the good news of the kingdom, it will go out to the ends of the earth. This promise, it's in two parts. You will receive power. You will be my witnesses. And those two parts, they they hang together. We mustn't separate them. The reason that they need the power of the Holy Spirit is to be his witnesses. They cannot be his witnesses without the power of the Holy Spirit. With the Holy Spirit... All things are possible, even the good news reaching the ends of the earth. But without the Holy Spirit, well, nothing is possible. As we read the book of Acts, isn't that exactly what we see? It strikes me that three things stand out. Uh, Firstly, the Holy Spirit gives power to bear witness. The Holy Spirit gives power to bear witness. In chapter 2, the the risen and exalted Lord Jesus pours out the Holy Spirit. The apostles are filled with power, and Peter stands up in front of a great crowd from every nation and bears witness to Jesus. Jesus. Let all Israel be assured of this, he says. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And wonderfully, Luke tells us that about 3,000 people accepted his message and were baptized. What's happening? The good news of the kingdom is starting to spread like ripples across the surface of a lake. But in this case, instead of those ripples dying away, the further they get from the center, that those ripples, they grow larger and larger until they become great waves that crash onto the shore. Chapters 3 to 7, the good news of the kingdom goes out into Jerusalem. Chapter 8, it it moves out further into Judea and Samaria. From chapter 10, it continues to make its way to the ends of the earth. Until eventually, in chapter 28, it spreads all the way to Rome itself. And Acts finishes it in much the same way it began. With the apostles, this time the apostle Paul, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom in Rome. And along the way, have you noticed how Luke keeps reassuring us that the gospel is making progress, that the ripples are spreading? So for example, in chapter 6, Luke says, the word of God spread, that the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, that the ripples are spreading out across the lake. And Luke is very clear why all of this is happening. Obviously, it's because of what the apostles and the other believers do, but but ultimately, it's not because of them. Ultimately, it's down to the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives power to bear witness. Secondly, the Holy Spirit gives power to keep on bearing witness. You see, it turns out that wherever the good news of the kingdom spreads, it provokes opposition. And we see this right from the beginning, don't we? So in chapter 2, when people hear the apostles speaking in other languages, they, they stop dead in their tracks. Luke tells us that some are amazed, some are perplexed. They want to know more. But others... Well, they make fun of them. So it goes on. Wherever the good news is proclaimed, there's always a mixed response. In chapter 4, as we'll see tomorrow, Peter and John are, are thrown into jail for the night. The next day, they're brought out and put on trial, but they keep on bearing witness to Jesus. Now, where do they find the courage to do that? Remember what happened after Jesus was arrested 
What what did Peter do then? He denied him. Not not once, not twice, but three times. What, What has happened to Peter that now, put on trial, he keeps on bearing witness to Jesus? Well, of course, Peter has met the risen Lord Jesus. But Peter has been filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives power to keep on bearing witness to Jesus. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit gives power to bear witness to all people. The picture in verse 8 is of the good news of the kingdom spreading out like ripples across the surface of a lake. But beneath the surface, there there looks a question. Who is this kingdom for? In other words, who can belong to the kingdom? And what do they have to do to be saved? And that question dominates the middle chapters of the book of Acts. And the spotlight falls on the apostle Peter. And we watch as the Holy Spirit works on Peter and changes his mind about whether someone like Cornelius is allowed to become a Christian. that The Holy Spirit persuades Peter and the church that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Even Gentiles like Cornelius can enter the kingdom. All that's required is faith. And repentance. Jesus said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The Holy Spirit gives power, power to bear witness and to keep on bearing witness and to bear witness to all people. The good news of the kingdom will go out to the ends of the earth. When that good news arrives in Rome, there's a sense of completion. And yet the story of the continuing work of Jesus, it isn't finished. Now, of course, you and I, we are not the apostles. We know that. That they had a unique role to play. That they were appointed personally by the Lord Jesus as those who had been with him from the beginning and seen him after he rose from the dead. We can't bear witness to Jesus as they did. But their witness has been recorded for us in the New Testament. And we're to teach that. We're to proclaim what they saw and heard. And it's very clear in Acts that every believer is given the gift of the Holy Spirit, and every believer has a part to play. And so as we read Acts, Luke wants to assure us, me and you, that the same Holy Spirit will give us power to speak. Now, I realize that the you here is plural. I realize that this is addressed to the church. But let me be personal for a moment. I don't know about you, but so often I I am tempted not to speak. I, I run a bit. Uh, I I run with a local running club. Uh, Some uh, some time ago, we were out for a run. Uh, We got partway through the run. We were just beginning to uh, to ramp it up. And someone said, as they do, so then, why are you a pastor? And I paused. What should I say? How should I put this? But... If I'm honest, that wasn't the only reason that I paused. I paused because I want to be part of the group. I paused because I feel the pressure of their disapproval. And you know what happened? 
while I paused. Someone just behind who hadn't heard the question that they said something else. And the opportunity was gone. It was one of those times when the Lord taught me a lesson. Let me tell you what I learned. I learned that I really should have anticipated a question like that. I really should have been prepared for it. I should have thought beforehand, what am I going to say when that comes up? It's not the first time I've been asked it. I should have thought through what to say. But you know what? I also learned that I need to pray. I need to pray for the power and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. I need to pray for boldness so that when I'm put on the spot and I'm tempted to fear men and women more than God, that the Holy Spirit will give me power to speak. I need to pray. The same Holy Spirit will give us power to speak. That's the promise. And the same Holy Spirit will give us power to keep on speaking. A number of commentators point out that in Acts, at the same good news preached in the power of the same Holy Spirit produces very different results from one situation to another. So in, in chapter 2, thousands believe. But of course, at other times, only only a few believe. In some places, the, 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 the preaching of the good news of the kingdom stirs up violent opposition. In other places, things are much more peaceful. And yet the point is, the risen Lord Jesus, he reigns in heaven and he will accomplish his purposes. Now, I, I don't know what your situation is like. I don't know how many people over the course of the last year that you have seen come to faith in the Lord Jesus. I don't know how much hostility you are facing. That The fact that the Lord Jesus reigns in heaven, it doesn't guarantee that the church I serve will flourish. It doesn't guarantee that the church you serve will flourish, but it does guarantee that his church will flourish. And he will accomplish his purposes. same Holy Spirit will give us power to speak. He'll give us power to keep on speaking, and he'll give us power to speak to all people. It's tempting, isn't it, to read those middle chapters of Acts and to be surprised, surprised that it took them so long for the penny to drop, for them to realize that God does not show favoritism but accepts all those who fear and trust him. Do you know what, though? The truth is that my heart is no different to theirs. John Wesley, by all accounts, once said this, parochialism is always the enemy of the gospel, and unchecked, we will naturally be parochial. Parochialism is always the enemy of the gospel, and unchecked, we will naturally be parochial. It is not, verse 8, a huge challenge to our innate parochialism. But we need to commit ourselves to proclaiming the good news of the kingdom as broadly as possible because that is what the risen Lord Jesus wants. He wants the good news of the kingdom to go out to the very ends of the earth. Now, doesn't that raise questions for us? Doesn't that raise questions about the makeup of our churches? To what extent do our churches reflect the local community in which God has put us? But doesn't it also raise questions about the makeup of our family of churches? To what extent do we reflect the increasingly diverse society? in which we live and serve. Pray.
Praise God for the gospel work that is going on in some of our more deprived communities. Praise God for that work. But brothers and sisters, we have so much more work to do. There are so many communities there that are untouched by the good news of the kingdom. In the same way, praise God for the the gospel work going on amongst black and ethnic minorities. But brothers and sisters, just look around the room. Look around the room. We are overwhelmingly white. Does that not break your heart? Does that not embarrass you just a little bit? Does it not trouble you? Dear Lord Jesus, how we need the power of your Holy Spirit to smash through our innate parochialism. Verse 8, verse 8 is a great challenge, but it's a wonderful promise. The risen Lord Jesus will accomplish his mission. The good news of the kingdom will go to the ends of the earth. So we draw to a close. Let me leave us with three things to take away. Three things to take away. Firstly, confidence. Confidence. We all need reassurance. And here it is. At the mission of the risen Lord Jesus, it will be accomplished. But the confidence that this gives us is a humble confidence, isn't it? Because ultimately, the good news of the kingdom goes out not because of us, not because of uh, our hard work, not because of our clever evangelistic strategies, not because of our wise or our perceptive leadership, but because of the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a humble confidence. And it's a realistic confidence as well. Doubt tends to creep in when our expectations are wrong, when the, 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 the reality that we experience doesn't quite match up to those things. Well, Luke is very clear that there is always a mixed response to the gospel. We mustn't be surprised when that happens. We mustn't be surprised when the going gets tough and we face opposition. Firstly, confidence. The mission of the risen Lord Jesus will be accomplished. Uh, Secondly, uh, clarity. You and I, we live and serve between the first and the second coming uh, of the Lord Jesus. Uh, And as we wait for him to return, we have got work to do. Uh, I take it that that's what the angels mean in verse 10. Uh, Stop staring into the sky. You've got work to do. As we give ourselves to that work, We need to keep the main thing, the main thing, don't we? Do you remember the quote that I read from John's book at the beginning? One of the temptations when we're feeling discouraged because we're not seeing much fruit is to start searching for the silver bullets, that that thing that will transform our ministry, that thing that will bring results. Brothers and sisters, can I say gently but clearly, there is no silver bullet. There is no silver bullet. If you've come here looking for one, I'm sorry. There is no silver bullet. Our job is to prayerfully proclaim the good news of the kingdom in the power of the Holy Spirit and to trust God to do with that as pleases him. Now, of course, of course, we can and we must skill up in the work that we do, if I can put it like that. Of course, we must be those who give ourselves to making progress in our ministry. It's no excuse not to do that. But there's no silver bullet in his sovereign will. But whether we see much fruit or we see little fruit, we can be sure of this. The mission of the risen Lord Jesus, it will be accomplished. 
the good news of the kingdom will reach the ends of the earth. Confidence, clarity, thirdly, dependence. Verse 8 teaches us something massively important about gospel work, doesn't it? We cannot do it in our own strength. We cannot do it in our own strength. And yet how often I am tempted to think that I can. How often I turn up at something without having prayed beforehand. How often I turn up at running club without having prayed about opportunities to talk to people about the Lord Jesus. How often I go to a pastoral situation and I've not brought it to God in prayer. How often I open up the scriptures to prepare and I don't commit it to God in prayer. Is that not a godless thing to do? Is that not a wicked thing for me to do? One Christian leader puts it like this. Self-sufficiency is insufficiency. Self-sufficiency is insufficiency. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. Without him, nothing is possible, but with him, all things are possible. I love the fact that uh, after Jesus has been taken up to heaven, that the apostles, they, the words of that old hymn, they trust and obey him, that they, uh, they do what he says, they go to Jerusalem and they wait. And what do they do as they wait? Verse 14, they all join together constantly in prayer. Now we're going to pick this up tomorrow, but isn't that where all of this should lead us. It isn't that where we should go. We we should go to our knees in prayerful dependence on God. And then we should get up and in the power of the Holy Spirit, proclaim the good news of the kingdom to anyone and to everyone. Brothers and sisters, we, we need reassurance, don't we? Well, here it is. Here it is. The mission of the risen Lord Jesus, it will be accomplished. The good news of the kingdom, it will go to the ends of the earth. And the same Holy Spirit who equipped them to bear witness to Jesus, he will give us power to speak and to keep on speaking and to speak to all people. Let's pray. Dear Father, we praise you for raising your son from the dead and exalting him to your right hand on high. We praise you, dear Father, that he has poured out the Holy Spirit. We praise you that the Holy Spirit gives us power to speak, to proclaim the scriptures and testify to the Lord Jesus. Father, please forgive us for our unwillingness to speak. Forgive us, Father, when we don't speak because of the pressure that we feel, the opposition that we face. But forgive our parochialism. Father, please, may your Holy Spirit change us as he changed Peter. May he give us power to speak and to keep on speaking and to speak to all. And Father, as we speak, give us confidence to trust your promise, clarity in the work that we do, and dependency on you. For the glory of our risen Lord Jesus, we pray.